Mr. Goldstein. So uh, here's a fellow that just reminded me we, we met like upwards of 19 years ago in New York City during the first dot-com days. Remember Pathfinder? R remember how, how Duracell was the, was the most innovative marketer on the internet? <laughs> Anyway, um, no, Seth and I have, have known each other for a while, and Seth has done some amazing stuff, one of which is co-authoring a book uh, called The Secret of Raising Money. And he's done it enough times that he's willing to now share some of his insights. And uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about his book. And he's also the CEO of a company called DJZ and Crossfader. Is Crossfader a DJZ product, or it's a different company? So, uh, so they have an awesome product called Crossfader that we're going to hear about. <laughs> Uh, we're going to hear, we're gonna hear, hear it. it. We're going to hear it big time uh, right after we hear about the secret of raising money. So let's, uh, oh, you're up. Let's do it. Seth. Thank you. Yeah, so My Miles and I and Scott Heiferman and Clay Shirky and a bunch, a couple of other folks were sort of the Silicon Alley 1995 sort of first wave diaspora, um, and those were good times. And we really felt like we were inventing the future, and now we're older and have kids. Um, yeah, so I wrote a book with um, one of uh, our co-founders at, at, at DJZ called The Secret of Raising Money, because uh, uh, Michael, who's not here today, um, was a freshly minted you know, Yale, slash investment banker and thought he knew everything um, to know about finance and economics um, until he met me and saw what really goes on in the sausage factory when you're trying to raise money. Um, and he's like, wow, like I'm seeing all these things and uh, I've never really read about what goes on behind the scenes from the entrepreneur's perspective and how can entrepreneurs actually create some semblance of leverage. And so he and I spent a couple months writing down um, kind of some of these lessons, breaking into a couple chapters. Um, we launched it a couple weeks ago online at thesecretofraisingmoney.com. And um, I thought I'd share a couple of uh, key highlights and um, open it up to some Q&A if people have any particular. It's a little bit like a self-help, like end of Wolf of Wall Street kind of thing where You've got a startup, you don't know how to raise money for it, I can kind of be your Tony Robbins and help you feel the charge and, and, and feel the power to do it yourself and walk through coals and do it. Um, so we'll see if somebody's brave enough to kind of share and be vulnerable. Um, so I think you have to start, I mean, how many people here are currently raising money or think you're gonna be needing to raise money in the next couple months? Um, what was that? Oh. I'm sorry, I just can't see. I'll just get blind in a sec. Can I have my sunglasses? No. Um, never mind. It's a joke. Uh, it's a really tough time to raise money. Um, you, you read about the huge financings that are going on with Uber and Dropbox, and you think, wow, there's so much money going around. Um, in some ways, you can think of it like a barbell. Um, at the very, very early stages, it's easier where it's just a concept. Um, there's a great saying that, that there's nothing like numbers to ruin a good story. And early on, you haven't screwed up and you haven't missed anything um, because it's just a concept. Uh, and people will, will, will back that. And then all the way through to the point where you, you're, you're taking off and everything is going up and to the right and you're generating lots of revenue is also a relatively easy time and people are rushing to get into those deals. But if you're like the vast majority of people in between, um, it's really a grind. So you start with being able to answer this, which is um, why is your solution inevitable? And I keep coming back to that word, like the inevitability. Like it, it, it has to be like a, a holy messianic kind of thing where you really, um, you see it, you believe it, that it's inevitable. And, and as we've talked to um, really some great VCs the last couple months and put some of the content uh, in the book. Um, Fred Wilson, Brad Feld, Mark Suster, um, Naval from AngelList, uh, just uh, Google Ventures, David Crane, John Callahan from True. What I hear again and again is what captivates them 
is the entrepreneur that comes to them that just has that look in their eye. It doesn't really matter where they're from. Obviously, the more technical, the better. Um, but just that feeling that um, they're going to figure it out. They don't know exactly how they're going to get there. Um, there's a saying that leaders um, can believe something before they see it. Most people need to see it to believe it. So you need to really convey that. In the book, we go into this notion of social proof and scarcity. Um, even the best investors um, are lemmings, which is they chase hot deals. Um, how do you create that deal heat as an entrepreneur? Um, if you have five term sheets, that's great. That's easier. I've had a couple companies that took off you know, so quickly, so aggressively, I just kind of went from VC to VC. Um, I spent a couple years in 99, 2000 as a VC with Fred Wilson in New York. I've been a pretty active angel. And you see when, when the tables turn. So these are two concepts that can help. So social proof is you know, other smart people are investing. And the first investor that you get, that you associate yourself with, or the first advisor that you associate yourself with is really, really important. So I have five more minutes, Miles? So I'll finish this, then I can do a couple minutes of Q&A. Okay. Um, so a couple companies ago, I started an investment research company. And we had um, investors as clients. And I was very deliberate when we started to get the smartest of the smart hedge funds to be our first clients. Because if they're your first clients, then the dumber, hedge, then the dumber mutual funds will follow. Right, it's the same thing with VCs. Um, it's okay, you know, you gotta be careful about name dropping, but if and when you do, just make sure, you know, you're starting with a name that's just impeccable. Um, the first investor in DJs was Danny Reimer at Index Ventures. And I'll put him up against anybody in the business in terms of the quality um, as an investor. Um, so just be really super mindful of that. And then scarcity is, um, this, this is a common selling technique, you know? Limited time offer, you know, we're, we're gonna close this down the next week or couple weeks. But just think about how you can use those two things to your advantage. Um, kind of a broader conversation, probably not now, but debt versus equity. Um, Michael and I differ, I actually think straight equity, priced equity is the way to go these days. Um, I'd say a couple years ago, you'd see a lot of companies, a lot of Y Combinator companies saying, okay, we've got a, an open note with no cap or an open note with a, $20 million cap for an idea. Um, investors want, don't want to invest in uncapped notes. Um, they want to be on the same side of the table as the entrepreneur. Um, they want to know exactly what they're buying, how much it's going to cost. If they're going to buy 10% for a million dollars, they want to know that now. They don't want to give you money and have you create a much more valuable company and then own less of it. Um, but can't really go through that right now. Um, you want to compose a, a really good, awesome email to your prospective investors about traction, social proof, product, and team. Um, that should go without saying. And finally, like think about Angelus as your corporate homepage. So if you're a service, obviously, for customers, consumers, enterprises, that's what your website's all about. Um, but more and more, I think investors want to go to, particularly early stage investors, want to go to AngelList in particular and have apples to apples. So the way that you compose your profile as a company in AngelList is something that you should spend a lot of time on. Um, and uh, I think that's it. So maybe I've got yeah, three minutes. Any good questions out there? Any particular challenges you're finding in terms of raising money? Let me hear you loud and clear. So Shout it to the heavens. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, so if you're going through the thing of trying to raise money and things are not going well, do you put a time limit on it? Like at what point do you, do you have any sort of suggestions for when you should bail out and think of things other to, to do other than try to raise money? When you should bail out in terms of trying to raise money or when you should shut down your business or when you should go get a job or all of the above? Mm -hmm. uh, so so I, I guess, uh, I mean, raising money from angels and the sort of thing you're talking about is a particular type of thing. Maybe there's other ways you've got to do it. Maybe instead of going for the huge big idea, you're gonna go for the shoestring budget with, with uh, you know, eating ramen kind of kind of approach. I mean, I don't know, there's, there's always something you can do, I assume, right? So, 
Yeah, I mean, I think, again, that's a, that's a complicated question. I think it really depends on you and like what the idea is and how much you put into it and how much money you have to spend on it and if you have any rich uncles or, um, you know, what space the idea is in. I mean, has anybody seen uh, Tin Cup with Kevin Costner? I've been thinking about that a lot lately. You know the end of it when like, you know, he can just win if he just like skips the hole, but for Christ's sake, he's gonna get over that water and he just goes on and on and on. Like, that's what it feels like to be an entrepreneur. Um, and particularly to be doing like a music company like I am, like it's horrible, right? In terms of like people hate music deals. So it's a compulsion, it's a pathology. It's not really like a choice. I wish I could choose to do something like enterprise cloud security encryption storage or something. Um, but then I wouldn't get to work with such awesome people. I mean, not that there's not awesome people in enterprise cloud encryption software security systems, but <laughs> just keep going. <laughs> but um, I don't know. There's, there's no really good answer to that. Back here. Hi. 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 Um, so my question is about basically when. So if you have that inevitable idea, at what point of the development of the idea should you ask for money? And then also related to that is like how big of, like how big should that initial request, uh, how big should that be? So a couple years ago I was um, working on a concept for an incubator called Up and to the Right. And I have uh, up2rt.com. Um, that I was gonna use, and the idea was to give $100,000 to a couple of entrepreneurs to allow them to build something for 100 days that ended up with the key metric going up and to the right. And if they couldn't do that, you know, you kind of split them apart and get them working on something else, but um, you know, it, it depends what the idea is, it depends, you know, there's a lot of depends, 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 but I think a couple hundred thousand dollars is probably what you need to get five or six months um, and a couple of people. You know, uh, depends whether it's consumer facing or enterprise facing or mobile or web based. Um, but maybe two or three people to work for four or five months to build something um, that's compelling. And then ironically, you wanna raise money kinda when you have a really exciting prototype but maybe before you've launched it. Because the minute you launch it, they're gonna wanna wait you to death and just wanna watch it without committing. And maybe you hit it so hard when you launch, it just crushes it, and then they're all chasing you. You know, but chances are it's not going to happen. You know, you want to really raise money when you've got the um, the maximum promise. Optimize around promise, around hope. Oh, hi. Time. Yeah. Here. <laughs> Hello. Um, so my question is about um, the angel. What type of investor are you? Consider an angel investor. Mm. Yeah, I think an angel investor is really anybody that can write a check from their own personal account, really. Um, there are angel funds now that are really just kind of like earlier stage uh, venture capitalists. Um, one of the earliest, early stage was first round capital a couple years ago, but now they're even later than some angels. Um, but you know, angels have always been seen as the as the fastest check. So you know, it used to be called doctors and lawyers, and then it was called friends and family. I think now just angels kind of puts a big wrapper around this class of people with money. And AngelList is definitely the best marketplace for that. 